Hi, this is Alana, and you are listening to the Praying Christian Women podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I am here with my co-host, Jamie. Today, we're going to be talking about generational sins and specifically how they might be impacting your life and ways that we can pray so that we don't continue to pass on generational sins and we can find freedom from them. So let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we just acknowledge you today as King. God, you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are victorious over strongholds and over any influences that might have a hold on us. Father, we acknowledge that and we claim that in Jesus' name. And we just pray that you'd open our eyes to any areas in our lives that might be from generational strongholds or things that have been passed on um, so that we can acknowledge them and move away from them and, and just stop the cycle with us, God. And we just pray that your blessing would be on this time together and that you would be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And our verse for today is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And I think as long as we hold on to that foundational truth that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, that we can go into this topic of generational sin with a positive slant, not to kind of bring ourselves down, but to really want to go in it with open eyes. What are the things holding us? And, um, and to recognize that through Christ, we have the power to be free and to be a new creation. Amen. Thank you for that encouragement. Our just for fun question today is, what is a bad habit you have that you know exactly where or who you got it from? I think for me, um, one of my bad habits is apologizing a lot and just kind <laughs> of seen that. living a life of apo- like having this apologetic mindset about just everything. And I get that from my mom. She was very apologetic and painfully aware of what other people thought of her. And I'm the same way where I'm just like, I make up things in my head about why I've offended someone or what I'm doing wrong. And she was like that too. And the funny thing is I used to tease her about it as a child. Oh, and now you're doing it. And now I'm doing it. And, it's, and, and another one that comes to mind is um, just kind of being a worrier. I I struggle with that. And I teased her about that as a child and it's come back to bite me because now that I have children, I'm very much like that. And I, I, I fight against it and I feel like I've come a long way, but those are two things that, that my mama gave me. She gave me some great things too, but those are two of the bad habits. Well, I think it's so funny you mentioned apologizing because just a few hours ago, you texted me and it was a question that would be easier to talk about. So I called you and you didn't even say hello. You just said, I'm sorry. That was the first <laughs> thing you said. I didn't even realize that. That's funny. Yeah, I think it's hilarious. Well, one of the annoying habits that I have since thankfully learned to break is that my dad taught me that the best way to avoid confrontation was to giggle when someone was mad at you. And so literally, my dad and I never once had a fight when I was growing up because one or both of us would start giggling if we were mad at the other one. And once I married my husband, I realized this is not the way most people act and actually <laughs> this, um, can make someone really mad. <laughs> so I had to learn to stop. <laughs> yeah. And he probably thinks you're laughing at him or making fun of him or condescending, you know, or did, you know, when you first started. Yeah. yeah. I could, it I could bad. see that. Yeah. I, I tend to laugh at inappropriate times, not when I'm angry, but at sad things. So if something oh, no. is really sad or tragic, I even now I like find myself like, I don't know what it is. It's like, I think this is horrible. And then something in me is like, if you laughed right now, you'd be the worst person in the world. <laughs> and so, and then I think, oh my gosh, I, I, I might actually laugh. <laughs> Oh, that's too funny. Is that weird? We all have our stuff, weird. don't we? <laughs> I guess. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Well, you know, it actually is a fun segue into talking about generational sins. 
And I, I figure before we get into talking about how to pray against these generational sins or even how to identify generational sins, we probably better define it, right? Yeah. You know, I think um, a conversation I had with a friend fairly recently kind of illustrates it maybe um, because it's not something that's specifically biblical or something that is like there's no handbook on it, but it's it's something that there are references in the Bible. And but but this um, friend of mine was saying that she had found out recently that there was a history of um, shamans in her family. And so it had been a generational thing where they passed it on from person to person by bloodline. And she saw it as there was a spiritual gift that had been given in her family of spirituality and discernment of the spiritual realm and spiritual things that had been twisted by Satan or by the flesh or whatever it is and had been corrupted by this this shaman or witch doctor practice. And she felt that that was actually handed down from generation to generation and and that in her case, and in this case, and I know it's not always, she felt like it was actually something that was designed for the good that through generations had been corrupted and twisted into sin. So I thought that was an interesting take on it. But I think in her mind, the generational sin was this this shamanism that had to be repented of and, and that she felt that she was restoring the original intent for her lineage or her family line. Right, right. So if we were going to boil it down into like a phrase, a generational sin is what? And especially kind of like compared to just a sin, you know, how is it different? Like a a spiritual stronghold on a person and their family or um, spiritual stronghold? Would you agree? I would, for sure. You know, and I, I think that if you look back, you can probably see, just like we started with our Just for Fun question, traits that you inherited from your parents, both the positive and the negative. And I would say that probably some of those really are just traits. You know, like I don't feel like I have been cursed with a spiritual or a generational sin of laughing at the wrong time. <laughs> Right. You know, so sometimes, you know, it, it's just something you learn, but sometimes I feel like maybe the distinction between what might just be a personality trait or even a personality weakness, if you want to call it that, and an actual generational sin is maybe the degree to which it, it uh, exerts its control over you. Do you think maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good distinction. Um and maybe also the nature of it. So, I mean, you know, it may be, maybe you find it impossible not to laugh and it totally controls you when you're in a situation of conflict. But the, I don't think you would consider laughing in the face of conflict to be sinful. So, right. But you know what's funny is I was thinking about generational sins just a couple months ago and. I think I identified one that actually is related to the laughter in a way. So I think that in my either genetics or my spiritual DNA or just in my upbringing, I was raised in such a way to avoid confrontation at all costs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the root of why my dad and I both giggle because we don't want to have the confrontation there. We feel nervous. And I look at incidents in my family's history, and I don't feel like that's sort of my story to share, but my ancestors went through a period where, I guess I'll have to share a tiny bit, otherwise it's not going to make any sense. So there are, is in my family background, people who were impacted by the Japanese American internment during World War II, and when you study that period of history, there were some people who spoke up against it, but the vast majority of the people who were interned accepted it and knew that this is just what happens when a country is at a war and wanted to be quiet and peaceful and make the most of it. And 
I really grew up admiring them. And I, I still have a lot of pride in being part of the Japanese American community and realizing that they went through this suffering with humility, with respect. But I started to wonder if the same root that kept people from speaking out about the injustice of the internment when it was happening is the same root that made my dad giggle and makes me giggle. And not that giggling itself is bad, but you can get to the point where you are such a peacekeeper that, that it is wrong. Maybe you don't stand up for the gospel like you should, or you don't have hard com conversations that could encourage or bless others because you don't want to be the confrontational one. So I started to think about that and wonder if that could actually be in a way considered a generational stronghold. It could, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think of, you know, the, the example with my mom and being very apologetic and afraid of what people thought of her. And, mm -hmm. you know, another thing I remember after she passed away, um, having a conversation with one of our family's best friends who was a, a pastor of ours. And um, he said something to me and it just, it made me cry. He was just saying something about, you know, she, something about her, how she always tried so hard and just was always striving. And, and, you know, and, and he said that in the context of, I see that in you also, not in a positive way necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like you're, just, you're always working so hard for approval and I think some of that came from some of her own story and, and some things that happened in her life that caused her to feel like she didn't measure up and she had to always work really hard to make sure that people approved of her. And so um, because I look at it and I look at my personal upbringing because I've actually had, you know, people ask like, well, what happened to you to make you like this? Because I was, I was an only child. I'm an only child. And I was very supported, very like the center of my parents' universe. And, and I had very supportive parents. I'd never felt beaten down or belittled, but there's something in me that has nothing to do with my upbringing other than maybe her example, but I, I still don't know because I didn't like that example. It wasn't something that I thought was good. I thought that she deserved more. And so I wonder if that could be somehow a spiritual spiritual um, stronghold that, that lingered. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think some generational sins are somewhat easy to identify if you look at things like maybe alcoholism or mm -hmm. drug addiction or abuse, cycles of abuse, mm -hmm. the compliance, you know, like if you see, for example, maybe you're married to someone who's abusive and you don't put an end to that, you know, those things I feel can definitely be passed down as, as generational traits, but sometimes it's a little harder, you know, it's harder to pinpoint. And so I'm wondering, does it matter? So I can recognize in myself that yes, sometimes I have a hard time standing up for the truth, standing up for God's word, because I try to avoid uncomfortable confrontations. Does it impact my prayers if I just want to pray against that and get over it myself versus if I'm looking at it as a generational sin issue? I think, I don't think, of, I, I don't believe that it does matter in terms of if it's there, it's there and going to God about it either way, I, I don't think makes a difference. But in the person, I think if you see it as... I think of a friend in college who um, was terrified of turning into their one of their parents. Um, they they didn't want to turn into that parent because that parent um, had an addiction, and they were kind of paralyzed with fear that they would turn into that parent. And so I I feel like. If we believe that something is a generational thing that's been passed down, it could go one of two ways. You could say, 
oh, this makes sense now. I see this in my past as a generational stronghold or sin, and now I can address it. Or you could be so afraid of, oh my goodness, this is bigger than just something I struggle with. This is something that's a family thing. So there's no way that I'm not going to turn out that way. So does that make sense that that could, you could look at it in one of two ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think what's important as a foundation is going back to that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come, regardless of where it comes from whether it's just a struggle of your own that came out of nowhere or whether it's a generational thing that God is bigger. So Mm -hmm. I don't think it makes a difference. I know that was a big long way of getting back to, I don't think it makes a difference to decide what, which thing it is. I think either way God has power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I could say the, the one area where I think it might make a difference is if it is generational I feel like you could be a little more specific in your prayers. So Mm -hmm. let's take um, emotional eating, which I know is a a trait that I picked up from one of my parents. And I've even seen it in my kids. I'm like, oh, this is not (laughs) not what I want to want to see. And I feel like on the one hand, I could just say, God, please help me to have a better mentality when it comes to food and have it stop there. But I think when my eyes were opened to the fact that this is a generational thing first, it helps me to to be more proactive in praying for my kids. I think it gives you an incentive for sure. Because if you yes. think about it on the one hand, if I remain emo- an emotional eater for the rest of my life, aside from just the kind of spiritual unhealthiness of that, really, the worst thing it does is make me less healthy physically. You know, but if I think about it as if I persist in this, I might be paving the way for, you know, not just my kids, but my grandkids and their kids to also struggle in this area. I think it gives more incentive to, to try to lick it. (laughs) And then I feel also like we have some biblical examples of the power of asking for forgiveness not only for your specific sins but for the sins of your past and so i've heard some really neat testimonies of people beginning to break down generational strongholds by confessing not just their sins but you know as far back as god has chosen to reveal that this has been an issue yeah and that can be really powerful well and it kind of brings up this this brought a story to my mind um of one of the just most sad (laughs) realizations that i've had recently which is um and it comes it comes from this same spirit of apologizing and self-deprecation that i've got in me and i did something that I don't even remember what it was, but I just remember I kind of muttered to myself, I just, I hate myself when I do that stuff. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, the words, I hate myself, when I tell my kids, don't ever say hate, never say hate about anyone and and obviously not about yourself. And, And my kids were in the car and I was muttering to myself, but they all heard it. That was bad enough. But then within a week, I heard my, one of my kids he made a mistake and said, oh, I hate myself. And I was devastated because I just realized I just planted a seed. And Mm -hmm. generational sins, they have to start somewhere. So even if it's something that you don't know happened with your predecessors, you know, it could start with you. So it is, it's a very big motivator to take that root and pull it out um, before it, it takes hold. Um, or to get it under control if it is something that's been a long time struggle. And it also brings up the question of, is this a, you know, well, it brings up two questions really. The The first one that I think of though is, is this something that is a spiritual stronghold? Like I know that some people will take this to an extreme and say, there's a demon of self-deprecation and it's literally right. attached to your back and mm-hmm. you're carrying it around and I can exercise that demon from you and then it's gone from your family. And you know what? That might be what it's like. The Bible doesn't mm-hmm. specifically say, um, but I hesitate to take it to that extreme 
when I'm not sure? Because what if it's, you know, what if, what if this idea of this generational sin is spiritual from the perspective of you passing on something just very practically to your kids that Mm -hmm. becomes part of them. It may not be a physical, you know, or whatever, a a demon attached to their back that jumps onto them too. Um, It's almost the Christian equivalent of the nature versus nurture debate. It is. So there is a question. Is this something that, that would have been there if your child had been raised by someone else? Or are they seeing your example and being influenced by it and taking right. that on because you think those seeds. Just like with nature and nurture, I think there's a, an awful amount of both mm-hmm. going on. I think, for example, with your kids overhearing that negative self-talk mm-hmm. and then doing the exact same thing in a week, I would say, yeah, that's a pretty obvious, natural consequence, yeah. you know, but I, I also feel like there is a spiritual component to that. I it makes that me really wonder... And, you know, I have no answer. I just thought this was an interesting question to muse on. In the case of adoption, for Mm -hmm. example, you know, like if you were adopted at birth and raised in one family and maybe you're having this struggle, you know, I feel like it's nature, nurture, and let's also throw in genetics because Mm -hmm. there are certain genes that make you more susceptible to certain kinds of sins, you know, like we all inherit sin nature, Mm -hmm. but certain sins can get passed on. You know, like there are certain people who have a genetic predisposition toward addiction. Now, it doesn't mean that just because you've got this predisposition, you're going to end up an addict. And it also doesn't mean that you can't become an addict because of your own behavioral choices, even if you don't have this predisposition. Right. Right. But, you know, it's there. And so I wonder about that, especially in the case of adoption. You know, let's say Mm -hmm. you're an adult and you don't know anything about your biological family. Are you responsible for kind of digging through, praying through those sin issues, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I, that's exactly what I'm thinking of is that that distinction and that you know talking about addiction brings us to the other thing that it brought up for me which is you know to make sure as kind of a disclaimer um, for people that are struggling with addictions um, just because God is sovereign over strongholds and just because he is powerful doesn't mean that every addict is delivered from the desire of that addiction the moment they become a Christian. Um, And, you know, I can't speak to what God does in each instance, but I know that, you know, Paul talks about there is a thorn that God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, which leads me to believe that there's a possibility that if you're struggling with addiction, if you're struggling with, with a, you know, something that there could be a time that God gives you what you need to overcome that, but not to be discouraged or feel like God isn't hearing you or meeting you in your need if you don't just not feel the need to pursue that or the or or if that is no longer appealing to you. Um, does that is do you understand my disclaimer? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think there's there's a fine line because God is powerful enough to to break strongholds, but how He does that could look different from di- for different people. And I I don't I think there is a person I've heard people say, the moment I became a believer, I didn't want to drink or smoke or do anything else, and I'm I'm a totally different person. And I've heard other people say, you know what, I, I'm an alcoholic, I met Jesus, and I haven't had a drink in two years, but every day, I kind of want to. Um, I don't believe that those two people are any less loved by God, or any less, uh, that God is any less powerful in the person's life that still struggles, or has um, the desire for that habit, or that addiction. Um, I don't know, do you agree or disagree? I do agree. And I think, you know, I've never struggled personally with something as, um, what sort I'm looking for, just as devastating as something like a drug addiction. And I feel like if 
you haven't been, you know, if you haven't faced that demon, you know, I'm using that more metaphorically than literally, right. yeah. you know, that really, I don't, I don't really know that <laughs> we can say a whole, a whole lot about it because yeah, mm -hmm. on the one hand, it would be wonderful to say that, oh yeah, well, God has promised to give you freedom from sin. And so your addiction should end the moment you're saved. I wish that were everybody's testimony. Yeah. I also happen to know it's not. And I know that mm -hmm. the, the loved ones of those people and those people themselves struggle so much with those questions, just the same as questions of physical healing in the face of a very serious illness. Why are some delivered mm -hmm. and why aren't others? I have no clue. No, but the, the scripture that comes to mind, I think it's first Corinthians ten thirteen, that just says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, but God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will always provide a way out um, so that you can stand up under it. And it just, you know, being delivered from a stronghold or a generational sin doesn't always mean that you'll be delivered from the temptation, but it does mean that God will undergird you. He will give you the strength. He will give you a way out to stand up under that temptation in the big picture. Um, that is a promise. And whatever else it looks like is between you and God. But I just don't want people to in any way come away from this feeling like, oh, if there is, you know, if I'm, I'm struggling with addiction, I'm doing something wrong if I'm mm -hmm. not feeling like I don't care about that thing anymore. There are not easy answers yeah. for sure. And sometimes mm -hmm. we are freed from the power of sin, but we're still not freed from the physical consequences. Right. You know, I grew up and was a teen in the 90s when AIDS was on the forefront of everybody's mind. And so I heard this analogy a lot in youth group. It would be as if someone who had led a promiscuous lifestyle, contracted HIV, got saved, stopped sleeping around, that person still has HIV, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we still have those physical consequences mm -hmm. and so yeah and like I said I'm I'm sorry I don't have more pat answers because I wish it was that simple that you know it's a, a done deal you're forgiven you're delivered and you're sanctified all in the course of one prayer and for some mm -hmm. people that is and for some that isn't and I feel like God in his wisdom just kind of knows what trajectory people are going to get put on. Yeah. And I feel like we definitely need compassion for those who are struggling with things that we have never had to battle. Yeah. But to know that in all of those things, that he's a redeemer, um, that he can take every single one of those things, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he can redeem it all for good. I just, I think of um, people that have gone through difficult circumstances that God takes to equip them to minister um, or, you know, to, um, to offer support for others going through that same thing in a way that nobody else could. Um, and so he's in it and, and we just, yeah, want to definitely encourage everyone out there that God is, God is in your struggle and he's, he's at work. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question. Do you feel like everybody is impacted by some degree of generational sin? Or do you feel like some people just get lucky and don't really have to have this on their radar at all? Obviously, I don't know. But my very strong opinion is yes, that everyone is impacted in some way. Um, partly because I have a background in science and genetically speaking, um, I, well, I, I'm not going to go into my theories. I've got all kinds of great theories, but I, I do feel like genetically speaking um, that we do have that, you know, we're, we're carrying around this cloak of flesh and mm -hmm. it weighs us down and everybody has their different stuff. And I believe that our stuff is definitely very dependent on where we come from. And yeah. so that's, that's my thought. And I believe that, as you said, you know, Satan capitalizes on our weaknesses. And if we have genetic weaknesses and inherent fleshly weaknesses, of course, those are the areas that Satan is going to just 
go to. You know, if you're trying to blow up a bridge, you're not going to blow up the strongest part. You're going to go to the weakest part. So I believe that there's a hand in hand relationship. I liked the way you said that there's both. There is Mm -hmm. nature versus nurture. There's, you know, yeah, there's spiritual and there's physical and they go hand in hand. But I believe that Satan is going to zero in on the weaknesses of our flesh and attack there. So if we figure out the weaknesses of our flesh, we can kind of have an idea of where Satan's going to be maybe. Yeah. No, I think that's well, well put. So what practical steps can we take when we're trying to pray against these generational strongholds? Well, like you said, just to identify what they are. And I think that starts with preliminary prayer and going in there and just asking God to reveal it. This friend that I was talking about with the, um, the witch doctor stuff in, in their past, um, actually encouraged me in this and said, you know, it's, it really is, has been very eye opening to go into asking God to reveal any generational sins or strongholds. And so that's something that, that got me thinking and has gotten me wanting to look more deeply into that and kind of thinking more about that because it's just one more way to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and search you and know your heart, test you, you know, like, um, okay, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but, you know, search me, oh God, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And just to see what's in there and to, to dredge it out because there may be things that you don't even know you know, you might be adopted. You may not have any idea who your parents were or are or what they've struggled with, but God could reveal supernaturally Mm -hmm. things that you need to be aware of. And I believe that. I do too. And I feel like even if you aren't adopted, you know, we can just be asking God, hey, can you show me if there's any any generational sin. So, you know, that's one side of identifying, or you could start with the sin itself and then just say, Hey God, will you show me if this is a generational thing Mm -hmm. or if this is just, you know, my flesh. (laughs) And yeah, I think developing that degree of discernment and asking God is a really good first step Mm -hmm. in identifying. And we already talked about it, but I think there's also we should talk about just the power of confessing Mm -hmm. those sins. You know, I think it's Nehemiah who started his prayer with, I and my fathers have sinned. So it's not pointing your finger and saying, wow, God, are you surprised that I'm struggling in this area? Have you seen what my parents are like? (laughs) But instead saying, God, I'm a sinner. My parents were sinners. This goes really far back and I need your help. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and then also taking ownership because there's a temptation, I think, you know, once you identify this as a generational thing, you could be tempted to say, well, I can't help it. I can't be yeah, more responsible. Yeah, great grandpa Hank's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great to blame shift because then you, you're free. But no matter what, whether it's an addiction, whether it's laughing, whether it's, you know, apologizing, all of those things, take ownership. It doesn't matter where it came from because there is power in acknowledging I have control of my choices and of the way that I deal with that heavy cloak of flesh that I carry around. You know, I have a choice. And and so I think taking ownership is a way to, first of all, empower yourself and second of all, to acknowledge God as the ultimate victor over those things. That's a really good point. And I think it's important to persevere because if you think about a generational sin, you know, this sin and stronghold, it may have had over a hundred years to be burrowing down deep, deep roots. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, that could feel very discouraging. So don't throw your hands up in the air and say, oh, this is too big for me. Remember, like God's given you the ax. It's big enough (laughs) or not even an ax. Like what would you use to get the roots out? Like a, I have no idea. I can picture the tool because I've used it, but I don't know what it is. It's this little round thing and you can just kind of like dig around. It's a little round tooly thing. God has given you the little round tooly thing. (laughs) Yes, the, <laughs> the, 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 the roto-rooter, no. The roto-rooter, I love it. So let's roto-root those roots out. But no, seriously, it can take more than just a blanket prayer. You know, we're talking about actual offensive warfare prayer 
to break down these strongholds. And I think especially if you have children, that is such a good incentive. So if you picture yourself, like I am fairly quiet and passive. So sometimes it's hard to picture myself, you know, as, as a mama bear, you know, or something like that. Like imagine if someone was trying to break into your house and kidnap your children. Like I don't care how quiet or passive you are or how timid you might feel you are. Something is going to go off in you and you are going to fight to the death to try to keep your child from getting taken from you. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is the kind of energy and mentality that we can bring into praying down generational strongholds when we want to not only break it for our own benefit, but to say this stronghold stops right here. I refuse for it to have this root in my child's life, in my grandchildren's lives. This stops now. I love that. Yeah, that is, that's all the motivation you need. <laughs> It really can be. so, And don't give up because these things can take power and energy and time to uproot for sure. It might be something that you just need to keep cycling through. You know, you might feel like you've dealt with it. And then a few months later, you realize, oh, I just got to the surface. There's a whole deeper layer. And then you could deal with that. And then a year later, oh, here it is again. So don't get discouraged. That's That's sort of why they're called roots <laughs> you know if you picture weeds like just pulling off the leaves in your garden of all the weeds one time isn't going to give you a weed-free garden yeah yeah all right is there anything else that you wanted to add jamie on the topic of generational so i'm just kind of grateful that like can you imagine how horrible it would be if someone with your pattern married someone with my pattern and so basically like their kids would be giggling all the time and then apologizing for it wouldn't that be awful and annoying <laughs> nobody would ever get anything done i know <laughs> well we are so glad you guys joined us for today's episode of the praying christian women podcast we would love for you to hit subscribe so you can keep getting more episodes as we talk about these issues that impact our prayer lives. Please leave us a review. This can really help other people learn about the show and be blessed by it too. And like always, we want to leave you with a blessing and benediction. May God preserve you on the day of temptation and give you full victory over sin. May no transgression have dominion over you, for he who is faithful will give you a way out of temptation that you may stand up under it. Sin shall not be your master so that you obey its evil desires. Instead, may the Spirit who gives us life set you free from the passions and desires that wage war against your soul, for you are not under law but under grace. And that's really funny because I just clicked that in. Is that for those random? I don't know. That's, yeah, we have a list of blessings and benedictions that we would like to leave with you every day. And I just, I do randomly put them in. I don't like scour them for relevant ones. So that's really, and I- that was I very good timing. I really think that's great timing. Thank you for that, God. Um, our benediction is from 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen.